This is The Future Of, where experts share their vision of the future and how their work is helping shape it for the better. I'm David Carsten. Western Australia's coastline is a haven for diverse marine life and ecosystems. From humpback whales to sea snails, the region is rich in biodiversity. But rising temperatures, invasive species and pollutants are all threatening the future of many forms of sea life and their habitats. In this episode, I was joined by Professor Fred Wells and Professor Monique Gagnon from Curtin's School of Molecular and Life Sciences. Professor Wells is researching the impacts of higher sea temperatures and Professor Gagnon is an expert on aquatic pollution. We discussed the factors impacting marine biodiversity in Western Australia. Now, if you'd like to find out more about Curtin's research, you can visit the links provided in the show notes. Professor Wells, tell us how long you have been involved in longitudinal research along Perth's coastline? <laughs> well, that's an interesting question because I started off at the WA Museum in 1976 and it wasn't longitudinal then, but now, 46, 47 years later, it is longitudinal. And it turns out to be quite a long time. You must have seen just an, a massive raft of change in those different spots along the coastline. The job of the museum, and I was there for 30 years, was to document the fauna of Western Australia. So coming from overseas, it was a third of a continent. And so only a small task, really, they set you? Well, tiny. <laughs> yeah, but it was good. It, it gave me an opportunity to go places that you'd never think of uh, and do things you'd never think of. We had a trip to the Kimberley one time. We named 46 islands. But who would ever think that you'd name an island? So it's been a very longitudinal study in your, your sense. But um, it's been interesting. Well, here in Perth, in the coastline along Perth, you, you have been focused on the invertebrates underwater there, whose populations have been affected over time. In what ways and which populations are we talking about? Well, back in 1982, I think it was, the uh, fisheries department was concerned about abalone. Abalone was a new interest to people in, the, in those days. People were collecting abalone. They had no idea of how many, where, what they were doing. So they banned collecting abalone and other mollusks on the platforms, platforms like Cottesloe, Triggs, Watermans, but well, Watermans was a reserve. Um, and they asked us to, to look at the mollusks, the seashell group, to see what was happening. So we started then in 1982. The Lewin Current was only described in 1980, so we had no real knowledge of how the systems were working here. And it's developed incredibly since then. We're talking over 40 years now, Professor Wells. What were the key points during that time period where you noticed some, according to your research, catastrophic change? Has it been incremental or have you noticed plunges in populations of these different mollusks and invertebrates? Well, the job of the museum was to look at different parts of the state and it depended pretty much on the funding that was available. So we moved around. But back in 2007, I was at Fisheries at that time we looked at the same platforms that we looked at in the 1980s and got pretty much the same results. Same species were there. Densities may have differed a little bit, but it's pretty much the same. Then uh, we went back in 2021 with Monique and others, and the West End of Run has changed dramatically. But inshore, Triggs, Cottesloe, Waterman had hardly changed at all. So what was going on? Well, as I said, the lunar current was only described in 1980. So one of the first jobs that we did was to go over to the West End of Rottenness. We knew that there were tropical species at the West End because people have been collecting them and bringing them in for identification, and, and we ourselves had collected some. But it turns out that Lewin Current comes down the coast, hits the West End of Rottenness, but doesn't come inshore. So the West End of Rottenness is very much influenced by the, the Lewin Current. And then in 2011, there was a huge heat wave along the marine environment here. There were others, but that was the big one. Uh, we think that's what caused the change in, at the West End's rotten nest. So there's a change in temperature, and it's evident when looking at the decline in populations. Uh, that's a, a pretty frightening discovery, isn't it? Well, it was frightening. It was also surprising, because if you stand at the lookout at Cape Lambing or looking down on Radar Reef, it looks okay, you know? You see things, oh, yeah, it looks good. It's beautiful. But when you got to go down there and start counting, measuring the number of individuals, then all just disappeared, 90% gone. So it came as quite a shock, really. Is that change in temperature affecting those populations specifically, or is it affecting their food source? It's affecting everything. The 2011 heat wave created a lot of interest in the marine science community, 
there was a lot of work done on what the effects were. There were effects on the ecology, the marine ecology along the entire west coast between Northwest Cape and Cape Lewin. So that was a massive change, and this is just the icing on the cake, if you will. It's a small part of a much bigger change. How does that affect the food chain? What feeds on the, the species that were being affected, such as mollusks and clams, starfish and the like? Well, you get fish come in, rock lobsters come in at night on the platforms. Uh, other species depend on, on what's living on the platforms, and they're not there. But the interesting part to me is that Trig and Cottesloe, the inshore platforms, everything looks normal. So it's the West End of Rot Nest, and it is very much, as far as we know, the West End of Rot Nest, Cape Lamming, right, a reef, not Rot Nest as a whole. It's so odd, really, isn't it? Just fascinating that there are such varying conditions in essentially the one location. Mm. Well, we knew that to start with because when we did the study in 1982, just after Lewin Current was described, the West End of Rot Nest had twice as many tropical species as the East End or as inshore. But if you look at density and biomass, it was much more important. So it wasn't just the number of species, but it was the number of individuals and, and how big they were. So the Lewin current has increased in temperature. Is that the conclusion you've drawn? Well, the West Coast is a hot spot for increasing sea surface temperature. But I think from the 1950s to about 2011, we're talking about six tenths of a degree. But the 2011 heat wave was like three degrees up to five degrees Celsius for a short period of time. And a short period, I mean months. So it's not a permanent increase, but it has created a, probably a permanent change in some of our environments. So the temperature has dialed back since then? It goes up and down. You know, there's an increasing number of heat waves worldwide. Um, increasing number, but also intensity of the heat waves, so that the catastrophic consequences become more so. There are three different marine environments. Does the Lewin current flow past all three, or does it taper off at, mm. at, at one point? And if that's the case, are those environments being affected differently by that rise in temperature? They're being affected differently. I'm not an oceanographer anymore, but you have the current coming across the Pacific. It's a huge equatorial current coming to the west. When it hits the Australasian area, it sort of bifurcates. Some of it goes down south, becomes the East Australian current. Others of it goes north into the uh, North Pacific area. But it's because it's so strong, there's an Indonesian through flow. Some of it comes through the islands of Indonesia. And that's big enough to generate the Lewin current. It's from memory a half a meter higher at the sea surface level at Northwest Cape than it is at Cape Lewin. It's flowing downhill in a sense. So we have the three different biogeographic areas and the Lewin current forms off the North Coast, comes down the West Coast, and then it turns left and has been measured as far as uh, Tasmania, remnants of it. So yes, in a sense, it does influence the entire state. Have you had the opportunity to look at the effects at different points along the coastline? I've done bits and pieces in different parts of the state. I've worked a lot in the Brolis, for example, but other people have looked on other areas. So I think it's pretty well understood now. But again, it was only described in 1980. So we're talking only 43 years ago. A lot of this is really new stuff. Well, that increase in temperature is, is one set of pressures put on a marine environment, but the other is pollution. Professor Gagnon, you've been studying the effects of pollution and also doing some amazing work in terms of identifying sources of pollution. Is that something that is affecting us just as much here on the coast of Western Australia as it is globally? Uh, fortunately, the coast of Western Australia is quite pollution-free. There is some local source of pollution, but not major source of pollution. And we have not been affected very much by major events like oil spills, for example. So we have quite a pristine coastline. It's quite healthy from the contaminants point of view. You've looked into fish fingerprints. I really want to know more about that. What does that entail in terms of identifying polluters and pollutants? Well, there is a research that we have conducted in collaboration with Dr. Steve Rowland from Plymouth University, as well as Dr. Francis Spilsbury and Dr. Adam Scarlett from Curtin University, where we wanted to determine if the fish that are exposed to oil can have the fingerprint from the original oil. And that comes from the fact that when we have an oil, we can analyze it and produce a chromatogram with the peaks that will identify the oil. Every oil will have a set of peaks. What is a chromatogram? 
A chromatogram is a graph that is generated by a chemical analysis, and it's a little bit like an, a cardio electrogram with peaks, but the peaks are all over the place and different. And those peaks would be different from every oil. So when an oil is spilled into the environment, we try to match what we collect in the environment to the original oil suspected of being spilled. That's the, what we call the regular fingerprint. Now, oil, especially in Western Australia, is quite light. That means it will dissipate in the environment quite rapidly. By the time we arrive on site to collect the sample, very often there is very little oil left or it's very degraded. There is some that has evaporated into the atmosphere, some oil goes into the water, some that is degraded by the UV rays from the sun. So those peaks on the chromatogram look quite different from the original oil that was spilled. So it is difficult to make the relationship between the oil that was spilled and the sample that we collect in the environment. So how do you solve that? Well, we identified a family of compounds that we call the sesquiterpenes. And it's compounds that are present in all oils. And those compounds occur in different amounts in each oil. So again, the signature, the amount of those sesquiterpene in each oil will be different according to the oil that was spilled. And those molecules have one part which is hydrophilic, which means it likes water, so it will dissolve in the water. And one end of the molecule, which is lipophilic, which means it likes the lipids. Therefore, those contaminants, when they are in the water or in the food of the fish, they will accumulate in the lipid of the fish and not be metabolized. Which means, later on, when there is an oil spill, instead of collecting an oil in the environment that has been degraded and changed in composition, we can actually look in the lipid of the fish to see if the signature of those sesquiterpene is similar to the oil that is suspected of being spilled. So, Professor Gagnon, is that uh, confirmed and, and proven? Yes, it has been proven. It has been published in the literature, reviewed by experts. And we even went further by discovering another type of molecules, the family of molecules, again, that we call the diamandoins which we can double confirm the origin of the oil. It's a family, again, of compound that is accumulated in the lipid of the fish and not metabolized very rapidly. That's an astonishing step forward and a really exciting development. How can this become part of policy or as part of procedure for investigating spills? Uh, when we investigate a spill, there's always a large number of parameters um, from the social point of view, the logistic point of view, political point of view is very important as well. Doing those chemical analysis to identify what is the original oil, to confirm it and demonstrate that there's not any other oil that has come in contact with the environment contributes to the weight of evidence to be able to identify the polluter that must pay. The polluter that must pay, that's very much a theme and, and motivator of your work. Has this now been identified as a legitimate tool? Yes, yes, it has been identified. Um, we still need to do some work in this regard. We know that those molecules accumulate in the lipid of the fish. Now we want to know, will they accumulate in the lipid of sessile organisms, such as oysters and bivalve in the environment? Because the fish move around. And depending on the species of fish that we deal with, it could be argued that the fish has moved 20, 30 kilometers and it was a different oil. If we can now identify the sign, the accumulation of those compounds, the sesquiterpene and the diamondoids in sessile organisms, it will again add to the weight of evidence. So there are two distinct pressures on our populations of invertebrates off the coast of Western Australia that you're both experts in. How did you join forces? Well, in 1991, we had a workshop in marine biology at Rottnest. One of the unexpected results was finding that some of the brain snails, the genus Conus, and the guys who worked on it was a guy called Conan, he found that the reproductive system was being affected by tribunal tin, which is used in boat paints, 
So it's an antifouling that stops stuff from growing on the hulls of ships, but it gets into the marine environment and creates all sorts of problems, one of which is the reproductive system of snails. So TBT was used worldwide. It was banned in small vessels under 25 meters by the EPA in Western Australia in 1993. We looked at it in 1996, and there was some improvement in the snails at that stage. But then Monique and I got together 25 years later and looked at how the snails were going at Rottnest after there was a progressive series of state, national, and international regulations on tributyl tin being used in vessel paints. So it's now banned globally? Well, in the international shipping it is by the International Maritime Organization. So that covers most of your big ships. Small coastal vessels in individual countries may not be covered. But we looked at it 25 years later and the snails are over covered. So it was good. A great outcome. Are you still collaborating on research to this day? We are doing invertebrate research together and we are assessing variety of anthropogenic pressure on various environments, just like our recent study at Cuttle Slow, Trig and Waterman's, which has demonstrated that those platforms were actually quite healthy, despite the fact there is road runoff, there is the uh, stamping pressures from people walking on the reef or collecting shells, etc., and, and a lot of some strain on those invertebrates. Despite all this, they look quite healthy, probably thanks to the good water exchange that is occurring on those platforms. Professor Gagnon, you studied originally in Quebec? Correct. In 1970, there was an oil spill off the coast of Nova Scotia. Was that ever spoken about in your childhood? and the effect that had on the local wildlife there? It was the SS Arrow. No, this is not something that has been discussed, but I did read some documents, some articles that were showing that because this environment is quite cold and summer is quite short, there's very little degradation of that oil. And some colleagues have collected some samples of oil between the rocks where there's not a lot of bacterial growth and not a lot of light or water movement to help with the degradation. And it was four to five years later at the time, uh, the oil between those rock crevices was identical to the original oil. So there was no degradation occurring because it's quite a cold environment. So Canada is a great place to store oil. Uh, it would be, yes. <laughs> um, uh, so what actually pushed you and motivated you in this direction. You've been specialising in this field for almost the entirety of your academic career. Yeah, I have worked for 30 years with oil spill. When I was studying in high school, I was always interested in pollution. I grew up in a very clean environment, but I was quite shocked by seeing the pollution around and wanted to do something about it. As I grew up, there was a few oil spills that occurred, and I was interested in seeing how, how can we solve that? How can we evaluate the effects? It's very difficult to evaluate and manage the effect because usually oil spill occur in open oceans or on the coastline and they are large scale. What we can do is be prepared to manage the effect should an oil spill occur. Did you have an opportunity to get on the ground on location and look at these events firsthand? Oh, absolutely, yes. For example, uh, when Australia had the 2009 Montara oil spill in the Timor Sea, Northern Australia, we spent several years going back on a vessel where we will be collecting fish and looking at the impact of the oil spill on reproduction, on the health of the fish as well. Because what we do to evaluate the impact of an oil spill is that we use uh, what we call biomarkers. They are similar to when you and I go to the pathology clinic, they will take samples of urine, blood, etc., and they will do tests on it and then they will give you your health status. We do the same thing with the fish. We collect biopsies, we get them to do the test, and uh, we can see if the fish is healthy or not. So we went back for many years on a vessel in the Timor Sea collecting fish in the area of the spill, as well as outside the area, and getting them to pass a health test to see if they were healthy and recovering. So that's one reason why I really like the research that I do, is that I'm paid to go fishing. <laughs> uh, Professor Wells spoke earlier about seeing the tangible effects of taking a toxin out of the environment and, and watching a population recover. How long does it take, in your experience, for a, a population of fish to actually recover 
in terms of stocks and health after a catastrophic oil spill? Well, we could see in the case of the Montara oil spill in the Timor Sea that the fish were affected, they were exposed, but they were not affected at the point where they were ill enough to stop reproducing or slow their growth. For about two years and a half, we could see some sign of exposure in the fish, but not ill effects. So we can see that about two years and a half was the time in the situation where the fish would have recovered. But I have to mention that in Australia, the oils, the crude oils that we carry around, that we extract, are typically quite light, which means they will evaporate rapidly, they will dissolve in the water, they will dissipate rapidly into the environment. And adding to that is that the waters are quite warm, which helps the oil to dissipate. So that was a good scenario to minimize the impact of oil on the environment. And where it occurred, it was 80 to 120 meter deep. So there was a lot of dissolving and spreading into the water column. In terms of oil spills, we got lucky, really. Yeah. If we have to have an oil spill, that was a good situation to have. A light oil, warm temperature, away from the shoreline. It was the best situation we can imagine if we have to have an oil spill. But hopefully this will not happen again. What have you seen in terms of what we're doing as a human population in relation to our pollutants? Are we getting anything right? Yeah, there is hope. There is hope because around the planet, there's a lot of systems that are there to watch the amount of pollution or follow up the amount of pollution, like the muscle watch system where muscles are collected around the world. Muscles are really good accumulators of contaminants and they are collected around the world on a periodical basis. And we can see that there is actually a reduction in the amount of contaminants that those muscles accumulate. So we are using less environmental contaminants, releasing them less into the environment, and that's good. And when it comes to massive transport of contaminants like oil, in 2020, very low sulfur fuel oils have been introduced. Traditionally, the vessels were powered by an oil that was 3.5% sulfur. Now the maximum they can have is 0.5%, which means they are much less polluting for the atmosphere, especially where there is a lot of port activity. However, this oil between the reservoir where it is extracted and when it is used undergoes a different cracking process, which means the oil has different characteristics. And we do not know at this point how these oils behave in the environment. The Mauritius oil spill was the first oil spill in the world that involved very low sulfur fuel oil. But due to the isolation of that country, there is very little research that has been done on the impact of that oil spill. I have not visited Mauritius, but uh, we have collaborators that are sending us samples. Professor Wells, your professional life has been largely based here in Western Australia. I've been here 46, almost 47 years. What is it about this place, this coastline, that has continued to fascinate you and keep you so intrigued? I grew up in Panama in Central America where we had two oceans. And I thought, you can't top that. I could go from one to the other in 90 minutes. And I did. You know, I would collect seashells on one coast in the Caribbean and then the same day collect in the Pacific Ocean. But here you've got a third of a continent just in Western Australia, 20,000 kilometers of coastline, that when I came was essentially unexplored. I mean, UWA had one marine biologist and fisheries had a number of people, but they were targeted at specific fisheries. And the museum had a broad brief of exploring a third of a continent. So this was 1976. Were we still whaling then? Yeah, I've been on the whaling station on the Flensing Dock once they brought in whales there. It's been a long and, and storied career and a, and a pretty engaging place from a professional point of view, it sounds like. Oh, it's fascinating, yeah. We've brought in, over the years, people from other parts of the world who work here and, and join us in, in researching WA. And everybody's been very much impressed by basically a very unpolluted coastline, extensive with the three different biogeographic regions. And I'm only talking about the shallow water. You get down deeper in the water and it's just still very much unexplored. And Professor Gunn, your time has, in parallel, been just as long here in Western Australia. What is next for you in terms of your research? Oh, I'm looking forward to investigate this new type of oil, the very low sulfur fuel oil, and how we can fingerprint those oil 
and to see how we can identify the oil of origin that has been spilled because despite all the precautions that are taken to avoid all spills, unfortunately, they will probably happen again and we need to be prepared. It's a very worthy mission and it's one that we have no doubt that you'll have success in. Thank you very much for your time today, Professor Gagnon and Professor Wells. Thank you very much both. Thank you for having us. You've been listening to The Future Of, a podcast powered by Curtin University. If you've enjoyed this episode, please share it. And if you want to hear more from experts, stay up to date by subscribing to us on your favourite podcast app. Bye for now.